Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday, church. <laughs> Today's verse is from Ezekiel 47, 1 to 12. Um, then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and behold, water was issuing from below the threshold of the temple toward the east, where the temple faced east. The water was flowing down from below the south end of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar. Then he brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around on the outside to the outer gate that faces toward the east. And behold, the water was trickling out on the south side. Going on eastward with a measuring line in his hand, the man measured a thousand cubits and then led me through the water, and it was ankle deep. Again he measured a thousand and led me through the water, and it was knee deep. Again he measured a thousand and led me through the water, and it was waist deep. Again he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass through, for the water had risen. It was deep enough to swim in, a river that could not be passed through. And he said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. As I went back, I saw on the bank of the river very many trees on the one side and on the other. And he said to me, This water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah and into the sea. When the water flows into the sea, the water will become fresh. And wherever the river goes, every living creature that swarms will live. And there will be very many fish, for this water goes there, that the water, that the waters of the sea may become fresh, so everything will live where the river goes. Fishermen will stand beside the sea, from Engadai to Enagaim, it will be a place for the spreading of nets. Its fish will be of very many kinds, like the fish of the great sea. But its swamps and marshes will not become fresh, they are to be left for salt. And on the banks on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month because the water for them flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. This is the word of the Lord. Hello, Red Men. Uh, great to be worshiping with you. Uh, my uh, least favorite day, uh, daylight savings starts, I feel like I lose an hour, and it just really interrupts uh, my uh, biorhythm, because you know, I'm just set on waking up at a certain time and uh, going through my routine, and it just like knocks out one hour from me. I, I just don't see the benefit of daylight savings, but we keep doing it, uh, kind of like sometimes as Christians, we keep doing things that are not beneficial to us, and we have to ask ourselves, why do you keep doing that, right? Uh, today, I want to talk about a topic uh, that Jesus talked about. It's about life and life in abundance. Today's sermon title is called A River Too Deep. And before I go into the Ezekiel text, I want to talk about John 7, verses 37 and 38. In John 7, verses 37 and 38, uh, it says, On the last day of the feast, this is the Feast of the Tabernacle, this is the 10th uh, feast in the Jewish calendar. Uh, this is a great feast. Uh, and so, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Right? So the great feast of the tabernacle, on the last day, the high priest would take a uh, golden uh, pitcher, and people will march behind him, and they will march all the way down to the pool of Siloam, and he will draw water from there. And as he heads back to the altar, people are following and chanting, praising God, and as he pours out this water from the golden pitcher, people will shout, pour it out, pour it out. And they're saying, you know, the grace of God and the blessings of God and the favor of God will be poured out on them. So this is a great feast of celebration. And so when this was about to happen, Jesus hijacks this celebration. And he just stands up and he says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers, torrents of living water. Right? 
And this is an answer to the question that we may have when Jesus said, hey, I came to give life and give it abundantly. So Jesus, what do you mean by abundant life? What is it and how can I taste it? How can I experience it? How can I experience this abundant life where there is no lack, where there is peace, where there is satisfaction and joy? And Jesus says, are you thirsty for that? Are you desiring for this abundant life? Come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water, just like the water he talked about with the woman at the well, Samaritan woman. He says, you drink the water, you're going to be thirsty again. But if you drink the water that I give you, you will never thirst. And the woman said, please give me the water so that I don't ever have to come back here again. I am tired of coming here in the heat of the day, avoiding people who mock me, who ridicule me. I want peace. I want rest. Jesus is offering to us peace with God, peace with ourselves. He's offering to us life that is abundant, filled with joy, joy which enables us and empowers us to overcome the difficult circumstances of life. And so he says, do you want it? Then you have to come to me, and you have to drink from me. Because this is the living water that I'm offering to you. And this very living water that Jesus is offering, Ezekiel is talking about in the very text that we read uh, this morning. And so when we look at this water, that Ezekiel is talking about, it comes from the throne of God. It comes from the temple, the very throne where God's presence is seated and is flowing out. It is not from us. It is not our effort. It is not our knowledge. It is not our righteousness or good deeds or pious deeds. It is from the Lord. The living water comes from God. And because it is coming from God, it has powerful, powerful results where it touches, right? Verse 8, it says, and he said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into Arabah and enters the sea where the water flows into the sea. The water will become fresh. It has healing powers, right? When we talk about water becoming fresh, Bible is saying the water is tainted. Water is salty. Even though the ocean water is refreshing to us, we cannot drink it. Because if you drink salty water, you will die. And so when the living water, this living water river flows, where there's sickness, where there's hopelessness, where there's despair, God tells us there will be healing. The living water that flows from Jesus will bring healing. He brings healing to our physical bodies. He brings healing to our emotions. He brings healing to our spirits. He brings healing to our relationships. In Matthew, Jesus heals a leper. And this is the very first miracle that Matthew talks about explicitly. He gives details to how Jesus healed this leper. It happened like this. Great crowd had gathered after Jesus, after the Sermon on the Mount, and this leper approached him and said, if you will, if you desire, I will be made clean. And the Bible says, Jesus says, I will, and touches him. And the man becomes completely healed. And then Jesus says, don't do anything else, but go to the priest immediately and give the offering that Moses requires of you so that the priest will restore you back into the community. Right? And so here is this man, a leper, man who has been a pariah, 
a man who's been outcast by the family and by the society because of leprosy, because people thought and believed that, wow, you must have done something seriously evil for you to have been stricken by this leprosy. He was rejected by his family, rejected by his community. No one dares to draw near to him. As a matter of fact, the law requires that you, when you enter town as a leper, you have to cover your head with your cloth and shout, unclean, 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 to let people know, hey, I'm dangerous, I'm filthy. And usually the townspeople's response was to pick up a rock and throw it at you. Don't come here. We don't want you here. You're filthy. Everywhere he went, he was a reject. But this man is asking Jesus, do you even want me to be healed? Do you have compassion for me that you would desire healing for me? That was his question. First thing Jesus did was reached out and he touched him. Jesus is saying, you're not filthy. You're not rejected. You're not unwanted. You're accepted. Jesus touches a leper. It's something no one did during Jesus' time. Jesus touches him, touches his emotion, touches his broken heart, touches his heart that was completely ripped because of all the rejection he's experienced. And then he tells him, I will. He tells him, yes, I want you to be made whole. Yes, it is my desire for you to be healed. That's the desire the Lord has for us. He wants us to be healed physically, emotionally, spiritually. And you know why when he was healed, Jesus says, don't do anything else. But first thing you need to do is then go and give the offering. It's not because Jesus was hungry for that offering, but it was the fastest way for this man to be reintroduced to his family and to his community. This was the way for him to be pronounced. He is now clean, he is now accepted, and he no longer should be pushed away. That's what Jesus wants. He says, I want you to belong. I want you to know you belong that you are loved and you are welcomed. Wherever the living water touches, there is healing. God can heal. God wants to heal. God wants to bring life back into our lives. And so that was the mission of Jesus Christ. In Luke 4, 18, when Jesus went into the synagogue and took a scroll from Isaiah, he began to read it. This is what he read. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me, and he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives and recovering sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed. This is the heart of God. This is the mission of Jesus. And this living water which flows out of Jesus brings that healing. It brings that life. Verse 9, it says, wherever the river goes, every living creature that swarms will live. And there will be very many fish, for this water goes there, that the waters of the sea may become fresh. So everything will live wherever the river goes. Everywhere the presence of Jesus and the love of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ goes, there is life, there is healing, there is restoration, there is forgiveness. This is the promise. This is the power. This is what Jesus came for. Everywhere the river goes, there will be life. Everywhere there goes, there will be swarming of fish. And the salty water will become fresh so that people can drink it and live. This is what happened to us. The river, river flowed into us. And it brought life. Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 6, Paul says it like this. And you were dead in the transgressions and sins. See, we were in that dead water. 
you were dead. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature, by nature, children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised up raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He can and will give a drink of water of life that will provide everlasting life and eternal joy in the presence of our heavenly Father. Not only does the river heal, not only does the river bring life, it brings fruit. Verse 12, it says, on the bank, on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month because the water for them flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. Our lives will have eternal meaning and significance. It's not something for people to look at and consume and forget. All your achievements, all the episodes, all the different interactions, we want it to last, we want it to remember, but it so soon fades. It is so soon forgotten, it is so soon taken for granted. But the life that we live as children of God, the fruit that we bear as God's people will have eternal significance and value. That is why Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you. That you would go and bear fruit, fruit that will last that what you do with your life will have eternal meaning and significance in the presence of the Father. When your life, you realize, has eternal significance, then you begin to realize that God-shaped void in your heart is being filled by his love and his presence in who you are to God as his child. So God invites us to go into this water. And I want to really ask you to think through with me about the significance of going into this river. In the beginning, he walks in. After a thousand cubit, it was ankle deep. Going on eastward with a measuring line in his hand, the man measured a thousand cubits and then led me through the water and it was ankle deep. Some people believe in Jesus as a fire insurance that, oh, if I believe in Jesus, I don't go to hell. That's all I want. I will not go to hell. At the end of my life, I will not be in hell. And that's the fire insurance I got when I accepted Christ. And I'm good with that. Let me tell you guys something. Some of us are committed to Jesus just enough to be miserable. Let me explain what that means. You know, I always, you know, struggle with weight. And one time, my mom paid, I think, a lot of money, like $500 or something, for my birthday gift, bought me a gym membership. And she's like, use it. No, you just wasted $500. I'm not using it. But I was a member. And so out of guilt, I went one day. And I went with a friend, and he was like, you know, into that stuff, pumping iron and all that. So he 
forced me to exercise. So for a guy who never exercised, who never lifted weight, and when you are forced by your like musclehead friend to exercise, next day I was in so much pain. Like I was trying to brush my teeth, and I realized I was doing this because my arm wouldn't lift. And I'm like, how can I get this toothbrush into my mouth? I couldn't do it. I had to bend down and try to put this thing in my mouth. And I was so miserable. It was just so much pain. And I never went back. And there were a couple other times in my life where I was dragged by my friend to work out like that. And every time, the next day, I would experience so much pain. And I would tell myself, I'm never going back. This is too painful. When you're ankle deep, sometimes that's what we do. We enter into Christianity, and we try the disciplines. We try to follow Jesus. And that initial pain, initial discipline, initial commitment feels like such a sacrifice, such a drag, such pain. And after trying to pray for a couple of days, after trying to shoot you for a couple of days, after trying to be faithful for this and that, you're like, oh, this is too hard, too painful. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. And you remain that person who is ankle deep, and you are committed just enough to be miserable if you're dealing with guilt and shame and how come I'm not experiencing the presence of God and love of God and the peace that Bible talks about. Where is it? Where is it? Because you remain ankle deep. Verse 4, he says, again, he measured a thousand and led me through the water, and it was knee deep. Knee deep. Knee deep means you are now starting to experience what it means to pray, to get on your knees and start to ask God to help you with your life because you realize that there are things no matter how hard you try, you just cannot do on your own. Maybe it's a promotion. Maybe it's an accomplishment. Or maybe it's about reconciliation with the person that you care about. Maybe it's about forgiveness. I am trying, but I find it difficult or impossible. And so we began to pray. Maybe you realize, oh man, my parents are not saved. And when I bring up the gospel, they completely shut the door on me. And I don't know how to talk to them. And so you pray. And as you pray, you're learning the rope. Sometimes God answers your pray, prayer immediately. And it's such a joy. But sometimes God says, keep praying or keep waiting. Or worse yet, sometimes God will say, no. Who is God? God is our father. Who are we to him? We are his children. I want you to know as God's children, you have the right and freedom to ask God whatever you want. That's your right. But as your Heavenly Father, God has the right to provide for your request or deny. That's a parent's right. Like Jedi can ask me for $1,000. That's his freedom. I don't mind that. But it is also my right to say yes or no. That doesn't make me an evil dad. Just makes me a wise dad, depending on what he's going to use it for. Right? So God can say yes, or God can say no, but that does not make God an evil father. Because I have seen many, many times as I raised Jedi and Jeremy, they would request some things that are just not good for them. And I would say no. And that was Jeremy's thing. Every time I said no, he would say, you're not nice. 
And I would tell him, it's not my job to be nice. It's my job to be your dad. And, you know, he would be so upset. But that's my job because I'm his father. I'm his loving father. And because God is loving, sometimes he will say no. Sometimes he will say, keep at it. Sometimes he will say, wait. When the right time comes, I will answer. Some of us are dabbling and experiencing the life based on prayer. But verse 4, second part, goes on to say, again, he measured a thousand and led me through the water, and it was waist deep. This is where things get serious, guys. This is where God says, let's get serious. This is what you guys call a GTR moment. Because waist deep, you're actually in a place you have to make a decision because the current of the river can actually knock you down. It is not so easy for you to wade through the waters as you did when the water was ankle deep or knee deep. When you're waist deep, you have to make a decision. Whoa, if it gets any deeper, <laughs> I'm going to be in over my head. This is dangerous. I need to pull out. I need to retreat. Or you can say, I'm going to let the waters carry me. And I'm going to go in deeper. Many of us have experienced God's love, God's grace, God's favor, his forgiveness. Some of us, we have experienced answered prayers. Some of us, we have experienced how God would speak to us and encourage us encourage us and open the right door at the right time. And so we have these experiences and encounters with God. And there comes a time where God says, my precious child, you are now waist deep. And I want you to make a decision. Are you going to retreat and go back to your old way of life? Being committed just enough to be miserable? Or are you going to fully trust me and allow yourself to be carried by the water and go deep, go deep with me? When God wants to train us in our faith, he will literally push us to the brink. He will literally push us to the edge of the cliff and ask us, do you trust me? Do you believe me? Do you trust me with everything you are? Or because you don't completely trust me, do you have a backup plan? So when the water is waist deep, you're still, you still have control, but you're struggling to maintain control. But verse 5, it says, again, he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass through. I was completely way in over my head. Deep water. For the water had risen. It was deep enough to swim a river that could not be passed through. A river that could not be passed through with our effort, with our brains, with our experience experience, with our righteousness, a river that cannot be passed through on our own. When you're this deep, your abilities cannot save you. Jesus put it very simply, right? John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do Nothing. That's pretty comprehensive, right? Like That's pretty complete. He says, he didn't say, you'll do something. No, he says, nothing. Nada. Right? God is not impressed by what you are able to do and where you're able to go without him. God is 
interested in taking you where you cannot go on your own. That is the Father's heart. God wants to take you places where you see it as impossible. You see it as unreachable. You see it as a dead dream. Reconciling with your father. Experiencing healing from the brokenness of your heart when you were rejected or betrayed by someone you truly loved and trusted in. Restoring all that was lost and stolen from you, including your core identity. And we look at it and we say, it's no longer possible. It is out of my reach. It is beyond my hopes and dreams. But that is where God wants to take us. That is where, as we surrender ourselves to the mercy of the power and the current of the river, the living water, God wants to take us. That our lives would become such a joy to the Father that our every day would be such an interaction with God that he receives it as our worship, as our offering. In Romans 12, 1, 2, it's a passage that we're very familiar with. You know, I appeal to you, therefore, my brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. Put your hand on your heart and answer, like the days that you live, every day that you live, can you truly say that your day is being offered to the Lord, holy and acceptable to God as a spiritual act of worship? Because this is what God is wanting to empower us to do. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. God is calling us to cross the river that cannot be crossed. That is his invitation. And the only way we can cross the river that is too deep, that cannot be crossed, is to throw ourselves in faith into the control of the Father. Do you know what we struggle with the most? Letting go of control. This, this is the main reason for our fight. The reason you have a fight with your best friend, the reason you have a fight with your boyfriend, the reason you fight your two-year-old toddler is control. Eat it like this. Don't eat this, don't eat that. And you think toddlers don't fight back? They fight back. They will urinate and defecate at times in areas you don't expect them to. They will put that food that you force them to take a bite out of and not chew. You, some of you are like that, right? You ran around with food in your mouth. Your mom's like, that's been in there for 15 minutes. Like, I'm not eating. I'm not chewing. Because it's about control. You can't control me. We try to control our relationships. We try to control the direction of our lives. And we fight God, saying, you will not have control. 
You can help me when I ask for help, but you cannot help Prince Philip. And God says, surrender. If you want to cross the river that is too deep to cross, you need to release unto me your life and allow the current and the powers of the living water to carry you through. This is God's promise. Isaiah 43, verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. Our Father who knows all things, who knows us better than we know ourselves, who loves us more than we love ourselves, and who has the power to raise the dead and create the universe with his words only. I am for you. I am not against you. I have the best intentions for you. And if you trust me with your life, you will experience the rivers of living water flowing out of you. Aren't we tired of fighting God? That's what the Holy Spirit said to Paul. You're like an ox kicking against a goat. A goat is a sharp device they put in the back of the ox so that when the ox kicks against it, it feels the pain and it's like, oh, I shouldn't fight. It is to control the ox, to plow. And God was saying to Apostle Paul, like, that's what you're doing. You're fighting against me? And you think you can control me? And you think you can have peace as you fight me? Our God, who is omniscient, our God, who is omnipotent, our God, who is omnipresent, and who has the best intentions for us, he says, will you trust me with your life? that I will lead you into life everlasting, eternal joy, and eternal peace. Will you trust me and allow me to carry you to the other side of the river that cannot be crossed? And I know that many of us, that's where we are. We're right there, waist deep. And God is asking, my precious child, will you surrender and jump into the river? I know that some of us, you know, if you are new in the faith, maybe you're just getting into that ankle deep or maybe you're just learning how to pray. That's a great place to be. But God is going to continue to ask you to come deeper with him. And when you come to the place of being waist deep, God is calling us to make that decision, make that surrender, make that commitment to follow Jesus, not only as a Savior, but as a Lord. Let's bow our heads. Why don't we just draw near to the Father and allow the Father's heart to speak to you in his love, in his tenderness. And as he invites you to trust him and follow him into the river, river that is too deep for us. But would you trust him to carry you, carry you across the river that we cannot cross on our own. And so 
just take a minute and let's just respond. When we struggle against God, that's what makes us weary. And to those of us who are weary, Jesus has an invitation. Come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to Jesus. Drink from him the living water. And out of your belly, out of your innermost being, will flow rivers of living water. Father, we just come before you. And Lord, we lift up this time. We lift up our hearts, God. And I know that many of us, we've been walking with you and we have experienced your goodness, your favor, your forgiveness and healing. And we've known for a while now, many of us, you are calling on us to make that full commitment to fully surrender. Lord, would you encourage us and empower us to fully trust you, fully surrender to you, Allow the rivers to carry us. Allow the river to carry us through. Oh, Holy Spirit, minister to us. Remove our fear, remove our doubts. Oh, Holy Spirit. Open our hearts to the reality of your love, of your kindness, and your favor. Touch us, God, with your amazing love. Help us to release the control that we choose to have and release them unto you because you are our good Father. Let's rise. Uh, let's worship the Lord together.